Hey guys, what's going on? It's Dave from Evil Eye Games. So now we have a basic overview of the editor, we're going to want to go ahead and actually create something. So I'm going to create a new actor so that we can talk about variables. So in order to create a new actor, we're going to go into our content folder here at the top. I'm going to select that and I'm going to right click and we're going to create a new blueprint class. Now it's going to give us an option for some common classes and you can use the drop down below to select all classes, but we want an actor which is the most basic object that you can place into the world. And we're going to select the actor button right here. So once we click on that, it's going to show us a new blueprint down here in our file explorer. And we're going to have the ability to name it. So I'm just going to simply name this BP underscore my actor. Now for clarity's sake, for the purposes of this video, so that we can differentiate between blueprints and C++ files, I'm going to go ahead and add the prefix uh, capital BP underscore before everything that we create from within blueprints. Now we have our new actor in place here. You're going to see that there is a star on the thumbnail, and that's going to mean that there are some changes that have been made that have not been saved. So to the left here, we're going to have the Save All button. I'm going to go ahead and click Save All, and we're going to select Save Selected. And that's going to go ahead and commit our file to disk. So let's go ahead and open up our actor by double clicking on it. And it's going to load it into this new window here. And I actually don't like working in a new window. You can actually manipulate these tabs around by left clicking on them and dragging them, and I can actually drop this in the main window tab system. So that way we can just use these tabs to switch between our main window and our actor window. To give a brief look around here at the actor, to the left here we have a components tab, and this is going to show us all of the different components that have been added to the actor. By default, Unreal Engine adds what's known as a default scene root here. And essentially, this is just an anchor point for the actor itself. So when we add this actor into the world, it's going to know where to add that manipulator. Now, when we go into creating a C++ actor, you're going to see that it doesn't add this default scene root like it does in blueprints. So we're going to actually have an actor that doesn't have a manipulator. But for now, we can just select where it says BP my actor self. Now below this we have a my blueprint tab and this gives us access to the different graphs. Uh, we have a area here for functions, a area for macros, an area for variables, and an area for event dispatchers. We're just going to be worrying about the variables today. So we're going to leave the rest of that for another video. And in our main viewport here, we can actually see what the actor would appear like in game. Now this default seed root that we have here is this white circle. And this isn't actually rendered in the game itself, but it just gives us a point of reference when we're designing the actor. To the right of our viewport tab here, we have a construction script. And the construction script is actually run as this actor is actually instanced. So when we need this actor to be called into our temporary memory so that it can be realized in the game world, this construction script will run at that point. To the right of our construction script, we have our event graph. And there are a couple of events that already exist in here. There's an event begin play, an event actor begin overlap, and an event tick. The event begin play fires when this actor is ready to be used in the level. And there is a difference between begin play and the construction script. So the construction script is fired as this actor is being instantiated. And the event begin play fires after everything has already been loaded into our temporary memory. The event actor begin overlap is fired whenever something else overlaps with our actor. We're not going to really deal with this yet. 
So we'll just leave it as is. And lastly, we have the event tick. And the event tick is fired every single time a new frame is rendered. So if you're getting 60 frames per second, this event is going to fire 60 times a second. So as soon as the graphics card goes, I have to render another frame, this event tick will go ahead and fire. Then finally over to the right here, we're going to have our details panel. And this details panel is going to show us detailed information about whatever we have that's selected. Right now we have the My Actor Self selected, and it's giving us the details for the actor itself. But we're not going to play with that too much right now. So we're just going to leave that to the side. What we really want to focus on today is we want to talk about variables. So down here in the My Blueprint area, we have a variable section. We can go ahead and click on plus variable, and that will go ahead and add a variable to our actor. Now, to address it up front, what exactly is a variable? A variable is just a container for the storage of some information. That's really it. So when we click on this create new variable here, it's going to give us the option to name it. And we're going to start with the basic types. So for this one, we're going to call this a test bool. And we're going to name it that because it's going to be a test boolean. So with this variable selected, if we look at our details panel over to the right here, you're going to see that we have information about the specific variable. So first off, we're going to have the variable name, we're going to have the variable type, uh, and we're going to have a bunch of options below this. Now, for the most part, we're going to leave these options as is for now. We're really not going to need a lot of them. But what we are going to address is the variable type. Now, one of the things about variables is you can't have just a generic variable. You have to declare what kind of information that variable is going to hold. So in this case, we're going to have a Boolean. So we want it set to the Boolean type, which is normally the default. If we click on the drop down, we're going to see that there's a whole list of different variable types that we can have that are available to us. The first of which being a Boolean, which is essentially a true or a false value. It's the most simple type of variable that we have available. And all it really does is it stores a value that is either true or false. Right below that, we have a byte, which is an 8-bit number, and it stores a positive whole number between the value of 0 and 255. There are specific circumstances where this is going to be useful, but for most people's uses, bytes aren't very common, to be honest. However, if you have a specific reason you need to hold a value between 0 and 255, that is a whole number, a byte is a great option. Below that, we have an integer, and an integer is a whole number that can be either positive or negative. So you can hold a value like positive 5, 0, negative 5, or 1,428. The important thing to know about integers is it only works in whole steps. You can't have decimal points or fractions. And that brings us to the next variable, which is a float, or a floating point number. And the floating point comes from the fact that it can have a decimal place. So a floating number can hold a number that is either positive or negative, and it can contain fractions or decimal places. Right below that, we have a name. And I'm just going to hold off on the name for a second so we can talk about a string, because a name is actually a type of string. So below the name, we have the string itself. And the string is basically a way to capture a series of characters. So for example, a sentence. If we have a series of characters in a sentence, we can go ahead and capture that and hold it within a string variable. One thing to note about the string variable is this is actually a entire class. So this is something that was added in by Unreal Engine 4 to handle strings. Now, you may be wondering what's the difference between a name and a string, and really it comes down to their use cases in the fact that a name is faster to compare than it is to compare two strings. So say you want to check against something that's named in the environment, and you want to see if it equals a name you're looking for. 
it'd be much faster to compare two names than to compare two strings. Now, in the grand scheme of things, with smaller end games, that really doesn't matter a whole lot. But you're going to find out that there are certain things within the game engine that use that name variable type. And right below our string is text. And the text, once again, is a specific type of string. The important thing to note about the text is that it's generally used for heads-up display elements to display text to the player. And one of the neat features of text is that this can be used for localization. So we can translate this into different languages. Below that, we have a vector. And a vector, once again, is a specialized class that was created by Epic for Unreal Engine. And this is actually a combination of three different variables. A vector contains three float values that are stored in one variable. Now, generally, the vector is used for two things. The three values are going to be an X, a Y, and a Z value. And a vector is most commonly interpreted as either a location in space or a direction. So as far as having a location in space, this is really easy. You have an X, Y, and Z coordinate. The X, Y, and Z will just determine where in the world this vector is located. A direction can be interpreted by taking the X, Y, and Z value and comparing it to the origin. So if you draw a line from the origin to this vector, that'll give you a direction. It's just important to note that you're going to have to keep track and use good notation in order to remember what a vector is tracking, whether it's tracking a direction or whether it is tracking an actual location in space. Next, we have a rotator. And a rotator is very similar to a vector in that it has three values that are floats. And what we use a rotator in general for is a rotation along the different X, Y, and Z planes. And you may be wondering, why do we have a rotator and a vector? And really, it comes down to easy notation for what we're using it for. That and the fact that vectors and the rotator classes have specialized functions with them, so you can perform specific operations based on whether the value you're working with is a rotation or if it's a location in space or a direction. And then finally, we have a transform here. And a transform is actually a combination of a vector. It contains a rotator, and then it contains a third float for scale. So if we want to package together information about something, and we want to know where it is, how it's oriented, and at what scale it exists, that's what a transform is used for. So let's go ahead and create some more variables while we're at it. So at the top here, you're going to notice that I am going to hit the Compile and the Save button frequently. And like I mentioned in the previous video, I'm going to use the Compile button to make sure that everything is essentially legit and that we haven't made any errors. On top of that, it's going to actually put into effect any changes that we make. So as soon as we change something and we hit the Compile button, that is going to make it effective. And then, of course, the Save button is obviously committing our changes to disk. So let's go ahead and create a couple more variables. So down here in our variables area, I'm going to go ahead and click on the plus variable. And we're going to call this our test int. And we're going to set the type of this to an integer. And then we'll go ahead, we'll add another variable. And we're going to call this our test float. And then if you want to change the type as well, we're going to click on that little icon here and we're going to set it to a float. And then finally, we're going to create a test string. And we're going to set it to type string. Once we have all these made, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit compile and save. And we have all four of these values existing within our actor. Now, if we click on the actor here, Underneath our details, we actually have a default value. And you're not going to be able to access this default value until you hit the Compile button after you've created a variable. 
So if I end up making another variable here, you'll notice underneath the default value, it's going to say, please compile the blueprint. So we have to hit that compile button in order to be able to set the value of this variable. So we're going to delete this variable that I just made. So I'm going to right click and just select delete. And we'll start with our Boolean here. And a Boolean being true false, you can either set it to false, which is the unchecked state, or you can set it to true, which is the checked state. So I'm going to set this to true for the moment. And we're going to go to our test integer. And in our test integer here, we can set a value. So if I try to enter something like 5.5 .5 and hit compile, you're going to notice that it's just going to truncate the decimal place off. So it's going to ignore the decimal completely. We can't set it to a decimal. Another neat feature that you can use is we, to the right, we have these little arrows. And if you left click on it and you slide left and right, it will go ahead and set that number. With the integer and with the float as well, there's going to be an option in the details for a slider range. So if we want to cap the range that this value can hold, we can set the slider range from a negative 10 to a positive 10, for example. And if we hit compile and we grab the slider, it is going to limit us to selecting a variable with a negative 10 and positive 10 range. But the thing to note is that we can still manually set this to something like a value of 15, no problem. And that brings us to the value range, which is right under the slider range. This will actually clamp the value of our integer. So if we set this to negative 10 and positive 10 for the range, and we go ahead and compile, and save. If we go ahead and slide this around here and say we set the value to 15, it is going to automatically reset the value to the closest maximum or minimum. So it won't actually allow us to set the value of this variable outside of that value range. And the same thing can be done with our float. So if we select our float variable, we can set a slider range in here to be negative 10, and positive 10, and the value range to negative 10 and positive 10 as well. And if we hit compile, we can go ahead and slide this around. And you're going to notice that it's going to work the same way, except we're going to have decimal places in there. So you can set this value to negative 7.247707. And then finally, we have our test string here. And we can give a test string in here a value of something like this is a test string variable, just to fill it in with a value of something. And we can go ahead and compile and save. And let's go ahead and we'll go back to our main window here. And we can actually grab our actor blueprint here by left clicking and dropping it into our viewport window here. And now, our actor actually exists within this level. And in the world outliner, you're going to see as we have this selected that we have a BP underscore my actor. So our actor actually exists within the level. Now it doesn't have much in it right now, but we're instantiating a class within the level. Now one other neat thing we can do with variables is we can actually go into the variables and say we want to adjust the values of these variables on the fly. So it, when we drag this actor into the world, we want to have options as to how we can set up this actor. So if we take a look at our variables list here, to the right of the name of the variable, we have this what looks like a little closed eye. And if we actually click on that, it's going to turn into a yellowed open eye. And that's going to set our value to be editable or public. So if we actually click on our test pool here, after I clicked on that I, you're going to notice that the editable check mark here is now checked. And this icon is going to be yellow. And if you mouse over, it's going to throw up this message saying the variable is public, but it's missing a tooltip. 
we can go ahead and add a tooltip into the value here. So in the section for tooltip, we can just say this is a test Boolean variable. And if we compile, now when we mouse over, you're going to see that that tooltip is going to show up when we hover our mouse over the variable itself. So let's compile and save this. And if we go back into our main window, we have our actor selected. You're going to see now that we have a default column here with our test boolean. And we can go ahead and actually manipulate the value of the variable within our actor. And if we end up changing it, you're going to see that there's this little yellow hooked arrow here. And that's going to notify us that the value has changed. And we can use this little yellow arrow by left clicking on it to reset it to its default value. So that'll give us an idea that we changed a value. And it'll also give us a way to set it back to its default value. So let's go ahead and make some of these other variables public as well. So I'm just going to click on all the eyes right now. And we're going to have to set a tooltip. So for the integer, we're just going to say this is a test integer variable. Then we'll do the same thing for our float. This is a test float variable. And then for our string, we'll just say that this is a test string variable. And we'll go ahead and hit compile and save. And if we go back to our main window, under our default tab here, we're going to see all of our variables. And if we mouse over them, we're going to go ahead and see the tooltip text as well. One other thing that we can do is we can go ahead and put these values into categories. So if we select our test boolean here, and we look in the details pane, we're going to have a selection for a category. And right now it says that it's in the default category, which is why in the editor window here for the details pane, it shows up under this default tab. So if we click on the drop down, there's nothing actually in there. So let's go ahead and create our own category. So we're going to call this our test category. And we're going to go ahead and compile and save. And you'll notice first off, that under our variables header right here, we have a new test category drop down with our bool within it. And if we go ahead and go back to our main window again and look at our actor, we're going to see that our test bool now exists under this header called test category. So this is a way that we can organize our variables so that we can group them together with other variables that have meaning that is relative to each other. So I'm going to grab the test integer here, and we're going to set this category. We're going to hit the drop down, and we're going to see our test category now resides in that drop down. So I'm going to select that. And then we're going to make another category for the float in the screen, or the string. And we're going to just call this another category. And then we'll click on the string, hit the drop down. We're going to have to actually compile this first. So we're going to select our float. We're going to call it another category. And we'll hit compile and save. And then we're going to select our string. And then drop down, select another category. And compile and save. So if we go back to our main window again, with our actor selected, we're going to see that we have a test category that contains our Boolean and integer. And we have another category that contains our float and our string. So now we have an idea of how to go ahead and create some variables and a few things that we can do with them within Blueprints. In the next video, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to create those same variables and set them up the same way within C++. So if you guys have any questions or comments, you can go ahead and leave them down below. 
or you can head over to my Facebook page and comment or message over there. And of course, guys, as always, thanks for watching.